Okay, so we're going to start here with Unit 4, Christology 9. So we're going to look at the record of the origin of the Messiah, Jesus. <clears throat> I got the word there, origin, highlighted because it's a very important word, not only because it denotes a very important uh, part of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, but also because of its history and the textual history of, of the uh, book of Matthew as we go through. Okay, so the dilemma. So there are two views, right? As I, as I see them, now this is all, a lot of this, it's my own personal um, interpretation, my own personal views. Oh, by the way, disclaimer, these are my views. There's are not wholly the views of Restoration Fellowship or Anthony Buzzard. Anthony can speak for himself, but I'm sure we're pretty much in agreement here with most of this. So that's the Orthodox view. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God, begotten, not made, who came down from heaven and became flesh. So that's the nice, it's called the Nicene Chalcedon Creed or Creeds, which date from 325, which was the famous Council of Nicaea, convened by the new Emperor Constantine. It was convened or brought together to bring uh, stability to the empire mostly. It was really a political council on the part of the emperor uh, because in the history of our faith, unfortunately, there's been a lot of bloodshed and a lot of uh, arguments. And one book that you could uh, look at that I would recommend is When Jesus Became God by Richard E. Rubinstein or Rubinstein. <clears throat> so this is a, a very good book, which has very good history. He's really a historian, a professor. Actually, he's a professor of conflict resolution mm -hmm. and public affairs at George Mason. I don't know if he's still there. Mm -hmm. He's a graduate of Harvard and uh, Oxford. Okay, didn't know that. So this, you know, this uh, history, it's not a theological book as such, but if you want to look into the history of what's called the Nicene Chalcedon and the whole Christology or Christological battles, as some historians call it, uh, this is a good book. Anthony, did you want to? Yeah, he's, he's not a Christian. No, he has every right not to be a Christian. He stayed in our house. He found us interesting because we sound exactly like the early Christians. So just beware that he's, he doesn't believe in Messiah. He's a historian. I think one day, and this is my personal opinion, much of what is called scholarship, people will shake their heads and say, my goodness. But he's helpful for us because he's confirming that Jesus was a Jew and Jesus certainly never claimed to be God. That's just silly. And yet we spend an awful lot of time dissecting what scholars say. And it gives us a certain credibility and a certain respectability not that we shouldn't be respectable to everybody, respectful, I, I believe in that, but we give respectability to all these PhDs and learned words all the time. One day we will say, my goodness, we were stupid, as I do, looking Armstrong, I was an idiot. I didn't know. Nobody taught me. I was a fool. I didn't know. Two gods in the God family? What? Sounds good to me. Now I know better. Yeah, in a, in a way, thanks, Anthony, in a way, uh, I prefer... Uh, uh, people who are agnostic or so mm. atheists because they're co they're coming at it from a purely you know non uh, biased uh, position and and this book is is very interesting because it's history you know it's not it's not uh, Mr. Rubens or Professor Rubinstein's you know personal um, recollections or personal interpretations it's just good history for any student of the Bible to know about this issue so so yeah so there is that uh position so i call it a dilemma because it, it's truly a dilemma it's 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 a problem really so you have this view and then you have what 
the uh, what we call the virgin birth narrative, which we find in mainly in Matthew and Luke. Now this is the origin of Jesus the Messiah. The angel said to Mary, Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Precisely for that reason, the baby to be father will be called Holy and the Son of God. So that's the dilemma, right? So you have begotten, not made. By the way, begotten is sort of an antiquated word nowadays. I, I like to paraphrase it as procreated. So procreated, but not created. That's really what the creeds say. But the uh, biblical account uh, seems to say otherwise. So we'll, we'll look at that as we go along. Uh, there's also a bit of confusion. Uh, church fathers, so-called church fathers of the first, second, third centuries. Um, for example, St. Athanasius, writing writing in the uh, early third, like uh, fourth century, says this. The woman which Christ was begotten was not the corporeal womb of Mary, but refers to the eternal begetting of the Son by the Father. Christ cannot be called a son and a creature. The two are contradictory. So that was the position of some of, or I would say most of the church fathers. But you also find sort of talk about contradiction. Uh, this this is from Athanasians on the opinion of Dionysus. Arians say that in a letter the blessed Dionysius, a writer's pupil, has said that the Son of God is a creature and made, and not his own by nature, but in essence alien from the Father. For that being a creature, he was not, he was not before he came to be. Yes, he wrote it, and we too admit that his letter runs thus. So Athanasius here, in this uh, ancient letter on the opinion of Dion Dionysius, uh, is talking about uh, uh, one of the early proponents of the non, let, let's call it non-eternal son, or the, uh, the son that came to existence was a creature by, by its very definition, that's what a son is, right? You, you can't be called a son and at the same time be eternal. I think that's a bit contradictory. So there were different views and a bit of confusion. And, and um, this letter is interesting in that it reflects an earlier church father called Tertullian, who also held a similar view. There's a famous quote that he says, uh, there was a time when the son was not as well. So it's a bit of a, of a confusing and, and, and by, um, let's say, by default, church father literature is confusing, by the way, because mm -hmm. they, they were mainly philosophers. They were mainly uh, people influenced by so-called Neoplatonist or Neoplatonist Neo ideas. So, but let's look at what the Bible says. So that's what we're, we should be interested in, right? Not so much the church fathers. It's, it's good to see the church fathers and what they believe because as I was talking to Anthony this morning, the church fathers have really done a job on, on the faith, you know, in, on all sides, on this issue, Christology, on the issue of the kingdom, on the issue of the gospel, on the issue of the nature of man, the immortality. I mean, they have really done a job, I, I believe. So let's look at the only one there is, the only, um, the only account of of where this Jesus came from, uh, who they called the Son of God. They, as in the people of, of the time, of course, uh, Jesus, by implication, time and again, as Anthony notes. Uh, identifies himself as the, son, as the son of God when he calls God his father. So let's read uh, those uh, passages there. So. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. 
Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child will be the Son of God. Right. So this is one of the accounts of where this Messiah, this Son of God, is, is, is said to originate from. We also have the account in Matthew 1. And let's start from, let's see, verse 18 now. Now the birth or origin of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, wanted to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, well, you can just, we'll, we'll talk about those words <laughs> as we go. He, he, uh, most of your translations in, in Matthew one twenty will yeah. reconceive. Yeah. Uh, but we'll look at that as we go. Verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sin, from their sins. Right. So I think a child under, would understand this. So it's very simple. God, if we believe there is a God, and obviously we do, we're Christians. But for others who may be watching who are still, you know, not sure as I was, I was, I grew up agnostic. But, you know, there's a God, and obviously if there's a God who created everything, he's very... He is very powerful. This God is very powerful. So it's easy for this God to uh, procreate, which is what we're reading here is the procreation of a human being in the womb of a, of a girl. Now Mary, most historians, uh, commentators would tell us, was probably te a teenage, earliest, 13, 14, the earliest. Uh, you know, the late, latest age, maybe 17. I mean, they married them very young back in the day. So, so what we're seeing here is the procreation of a human being. And that's the only account we have, really. We have illusions of it. We'll look at some of those as we go, of this account called the virgin birth in the other Gospels, in John particularly, we will look at. But really, this is all we have. So let's look at this account in, in, in a bit of more detail. So the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels says, What we find in Matthew and Luke is not the story of some sort of sacred marriage or a divine being descending to earth in the guise of a man, but rather the story of a miraculous conception without aid of any man, divine or otherwise. So I, th I think that's what I just said. I forgot I had this quote. So basically what I just say is backed up by very reputable dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels is a very uh, standard work out there. So let's see. Um, so we have this account, but as we saw earlier, we have two views battling it out, right? So we have, let me just go back to this meme. So we have the dilemma. We have the orthodox view and we have the Christian view of the Gospels. Naturally, in the transmission of the New Testament, and by the way, um, uh, the New Testament as we have it, we don't have originals, by the way. This is just a side note here. But it's important because I'm going to get it a little bit into the textual history of the, of the New Testament books, especially Matthew and Luke. So, I'll just say this, what we have, you know, your Bible has no originals. And that's true for any book of antiquity. No book of antiquity, there, there are no originals. Mm -hmm. They don't survive time, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like paper, papyrus at that time. Uh, we do have tablets. We do have stones, engravings, you know, that archaeologists find uh, from time to time. But the New Testament was transmitted through a very early form of books called papyri, papyri, 
uh, they, they were rolled up and, and so on. But they, obviously, they were very fragile. So what happened is early Christians, zealous Christians, and we thank them for it, copied these documents uh, very meticulously, but nonetheless, uh, in a very fallible fashion, in a very, uh, how, how can I put it, uh, human fashion, they made a lot of mistakes. But most of the mistakes in the transmission are, are very minor. It's a, they're mistakes like they forgot to cross the T, they forgot to dot the I, you know, things like that. But then you have serious corruptions. Now, what I'll show you here is what has come to be known as the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Uh, now, this is the title of a book that, if you're interested in this, uh, this is the book here by Bart D. Ehrman. This book was written in the early 90s when uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Ehrman was a, um, a Christian. He was a believer. He grew up a fundamental Christian. By that, I mean uh, these are people who believe that the Bible is infallible, has no errors. It's sort of a sort of Islamic view where they believe that the text has no errors. So that's what Professor Ehrman used to believe. And because of that, he entered a field where he found a lot of errors. So it sort of, you know, messed up his fundamental upbringing, to, to say the least. So unfortunately, Mr. Ehrman, about 10, 12 years ago now, uh, lost the faith and now is a self-proclaimed agnostic. But this book he wrote while he was still, let's say, a believer. So it's called The Orthodox of Corruption because Mr. Ehrman, who's become what we, we call a textual critic, he found many uh, corruptions uh, of the uh, New Testament books, and I'll show you one that he found. And it has to do with the very important verse 18 in the uh, one of the virgin birth narratives. So the origin of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The origin of Jesus was like this. Scribes changed Genesis to Genesis. Both Genesis and Genesis with double N can mean birth, so that either one could be appropriate in the context. But unlike the corrupted reading, Genesis with one end can also mean creation, beginning, and origination. The original text could well be taken to apply that this is the moment in which Jesus Christ comes into existence. In point of fact, there is nothing in Matthew's narrative, either here or elsewhere throughout the Gospel, to suggest that he knew or subscribed to the notion that Christ had existed prior to his birth. Now, as far as I know, Professor Ehrman still obviously uh, holds to this finding of uh, decades ago now. This book was released in 92. So what's that, 25 years? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. So yeah, so this is something the scribes, not the scribes are the people who copied the text. So. So this is a very telling corruption. This is one of the reasons why I personally uh, now reject the so-called pre-existence or the eternality, the eternal nature of the sun. This is, I think this evidence and many others, but this one was really for me personally, the huge or huge as we say now, uh, because what's going on here, you have to, you know, uh, try and get into these people's heads, the early scribes. So what's going on here? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? Another corruption Professor Ehrman found was in Luke 135. The child that will be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. A number of witnesses amend this declaration to include a significant <coughs> prepositional phrase. The child that will be born from you will be called Holy. Variation due to Irenaeus, Tertullian, and others taking offense at Gnostic claims that Christ did not come from Mary, but came through her, like water through a pipe. 
So although we have orthodox corruptions, we also have other corruptions. Now this is a very interesting one because it's from the other group, the group that said, wait a minute, he, you know, the son didn't just descend from heaven and, or go through Mary. He actually had an origin in, in the womb of Mary. That's what Luke is saying. So they actually went on and changed the text. So whichever side of, of this argument you're on, we shouldn't mess with the text. You know, we should just leave it as is and try and harmonize the text. So these people on both sides, so both are culpable. By both, I mean those holding to a pre so-called pre-existence or eternality of the sun, and those not holding to that. There are both corruptions from both teams, let's call it. But that's a big no-no. Uh, let's see. There's also, uh, by the way, I call these crime scenes. This is from um, a talk I did uh, last year at the conference called Crime Scene Investigation regarding the word begotten or procreated. Uh, crime scene two, uh, there's also an interesting one in, actually let's, if you can read that passage. Actually it's here, uh, yes. So in 1 John 5, 18 we read, he who was born of God keeps him. Some translations read it this way, right? So he who was born, obviously a reference to the son, keeps him, that is the Christian. What do you have there? This is a... We know that no one who is born of God <clears throat> sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Okay, so that this is the enemy. Right. And New American Standard, uh huh. Okay, New American Standard, one one of a handful that get it right. But you also have this reading: He that has been born of God keeps himself. Mm -hmm. You know the. The huge difference there. That's King James. So now the the interpretation is mainly in the re so-called received text, which is reflected in the King James versions. Mm -hmm. uh, this has to do with your rebirth, being born again. It's talking about the Christian. Mm -hmm. Now this is reflected in Darby ASV, as I said, the received text. Uh, Ehrman says this. The choice is complicated by the textual issue. For among a range of Old Latin, Coptic, and later Greek manuscripts, the final clause, the one who has been born of God keeps him, has been changed to read the birth from God keeps him. Orthodox scribes may well have found the text awkward, for one could readily ask, when was Christ born of God? Huge question, right? Huge question. <laughs> Uh, that the early scribes are asking themselves. So they're reading, wait a minute, the, the son was born at some point in time? Well, yeah, that goes against... Forgotten. Yeah, Yeah. the son was procreated at, at some point? At a point, yeah. At a point in time? <laughs> That's very troubling for us, said the scribe. Uh, so my point here is that there is a, a long crime scene of... Uh, people messing with the text, corrupting the text to suit their points of view from both sides, but mainly from the what we now call the orthodox side, the Nicene Chalcedon side. And that's why this uh, book by Dr. Ehrman is so important because the evidence is there. You know, even though he was a, a fundamentalist Christian at the time, he had no choice or so he thought, and to our, to, to, to our surprise, to my surprise, he had no choice but to just uh, report, report his, his findings. That's why it's such a shocking book, and it still remains a seminal work. Uh, N.T. Wright uh, called it a, the, the seminal uh, New uh, work on New Testament in the last 50 years, I believe. So... <clears throat> Let's see, <clears throat> excuse me. There's also uh, another interesting corruption. Well, interesting is a, an understatement. A huge corruption, virgin birth in John. Now John is interesting because it's, it's taught, it's taught in theological schools that the virgin birth is only found in Matthew and Luke. And overall they're right. 
that's where we get as I as I said there's that's where you get the only account really of but John uh, I I'm going to argue right now along with others <laughs> that John also has the virgin birth there but it's hidden by a corruption in the text another corruption now if you look at the uh let's see actually let, let's read that honey uh can we if you if we look at the text of john one the famous john one right so john one as we know in the beginning was the word the word was with god and so on right now this word says john uh created all things now this is huge debate out there whether the word was a person uh what was the word of who was the word of what etc so um we believe the word <laughs> actually the jews never saw the word as an actual distinct separate person from god by the way that's the jewish view uh you know they have a thing called personification in jewish writings um an example is uh let, let, let me show you here for example personification of uh, lady wisdom right so you have proverbs 8 very famous does not wisdom call out uh, at the top of the elevated places and so on uh, so wisdom is personified here by that i mean uh, it comes across as as if it's a separate distinct person but any jew all jews know that there is no such person called wisdom and note verse 12 by the way this is very much uh, neglected and, and ignored that there's someone with wisdom people don't talk about prudence you know we never talk about hey who is prudence i wisdom live with prudence so yes, obviously there's two more and i find knowledge and discretion what is so it? who are they <laughs> <laughs> the same oh okay the <laughs> so you've got four people then <laughs> so you have uh, if we take this literally yes yes saying, we right? take it literally i wisdom live with prudent prudence and i find knowledge and discretion so who are those my neighbors maybe <laughs> right so you see i mean we're we're sort of mocking tone here but it, it's really not a, a good way to read the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, first of all, it's an ancient Near Eastern work. It's a Jewish book. It's, it has its own brand of idioms, its own brand of style. Its own, you know, we don't talk this way now. Sometimes we do, you know, I'll, I give you my word, for example, things like that, but very rarely. But in the Old Testament, this is everywhere. You, you got trees clapping their hands and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so this is called uh, a, the personification of one of God's attributes. Let, let's put it that way. Um, uh, Tukba says that in Ecclesiastes 2.3, I'm just reading the chat here. Ecclesiastes 2.3 is interesting also in order to understand Hebrew view of wisdom. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2.3. He says, I thought deeply about the effects of indulging myself with wine, all the while my mind was guiding me with wisdom and the effects of behaving foolishly, so that I might discover what is profitable for people to do on earth during the few days of their lives. Okay. So wisdom is there too. And my heart was leading along in wisdom. Okay, so that's uh, wisdom there represented as well. <clears throat> so to go back to uh, John, so many people are, are reading John to this day, unfortunately, in a very literal Western sort of way of looking at it. And one of the fatal things you, you, you uh, will ever do is to capitalize the word, you know, you, you capitalize names, you capitalize mm -hmm. a person, but because it's unfortunate, uh, modern tr translators see the word as a separate distinct person, 
they, they do that. But and the other fatal mistake is to use personal singular pronouns like him. All things were created by him, apart from him. Again, uh, Anthony has an excellent article uh, on the history of the of the translations here. Let's see, what's it called? John one. Here we go. Mm -hmm. John one in fifty plus English trans translations. Uh, an article by Anthony, and you can see how the early English translators, uh, mm -hmm. mostly Protestants, had it instead of he because they saw the word as wisdom. It wasn't an actual person or prudence or knowledge or mm -hmm. et cetera. So we have very good uh, history there that this was not always the case, but unfortunately. So, <clears throat> so this word, says the prologue, um, is the active part of creation, right? It's through the word that all things came to be, etc. In the word was life, and so on, right? And then the sequence moves to the word now is described as the light, right? In verse 9, the, the true light was coming into the world. By the way, that's a Hebrew idiom uh, for birth. Coming to come into the world means you're born. To go out of the world means you're dead. Doesn't mean you literally are pulled out of the world. But these are Hebrew ways of speaking, coming into the world. So it's now telling us that this one of the uh, prime attributes of God is somehow coming into this world. It will, this will be born. Okay? So, <clears throat> then, and then we get the he. Now the attribute, which was non-personal, is described in very personal ways. Now, Anthony, I'd like for you to share here your view about verse 10, which is, uh, I think, key, and I'll just unmute you there. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Well, there's a nice point that in verse 5, <coughs> the light is an it. And that's what we would expect because light happens to be neuter in Greek. But deliberately in verse 10, John has turned that light into a person. It's become a him. Uh, to use a technical term, which I hate even to think about, these technical terms make the subject sound more difficult than it is. But a translation ad sensum, meaning to create the real sense, you have turned that light, which is new to a thing, into a person in verse 10. It's a him there. In Greek, afton is a masculine pronoun. It actually disagrees grammatically with the neuter. It ought right. to be it there. In right, the so before, before the verse 10, mm -hmm. the writer is using it. Yeah. And then suddenly there's a change in verse 10. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Now, why do you think that that is? Well, but presumably because John is now telling us that when the Son is born, the it, the light, and by the way, light dwells with God in Daniel 2.22. Light dwells with God. Daniel 2.22, that's an, a good uh, substantiating verse. That light has now become a person, and immediately we, we behold the only begotten Son. Okay, so this light that is with God, just like the word was with God, is coming or into the world, is born. Okay, so now that's why the writer here breaks, as Anthony notes, the, the grammar here. And now we go from a need to a he. Okay, so my point here is that there's a change. Okay, and this change is it's called traditionally the incarnation. When the word that is the light, that is the life, by the way, they're all synonymous, word, light, and life. They're synonyms for the same thing, which is a, a, the creative quality of God. This, this qualities, John is telling us, is now in the world. And how is it now in the world? Well, then we get to the famous verse 14. It, re 
it, these qualities will reside in a human being, not in a pre-existent word, got the word or got the son. No, those qualities, those, and those qualities, by the way, are eternal. And I agree with Trinitarians that the world, the word is eternal. The word of God is eternal, of course, just like the wisdom of God and so on. Yes, those qualities belong to God, and God has no beginning, no ending, obviously. That's what makes him God. Now, in verse 14, we get the famous, that word, that, that word of life, and by the way, you can throw in here uh, 1 John uh, 1, which is, First John 1, by the way, is the a commentary of this. This is what we proclaim, what was, note the what, Right? Not a who. What was from the beginning? Well, what was from the beginning? The word, the light, the light. Mm -hmm. What we have heard, what we have seen, and it goes on to basically give us a commentary on, on how uh, the man Jesus comes to embody all those qualities of God in a very unique way. And, and um, a very unprecedented way. Uh, Jesus is a unique human being. You know, um, we always get attacked for minimizing Jesus. Oh, you guys don't believe Jesus is God, or you don't believe he pre-existed. Therefore, you're, you're minimizing his, his uh, true identity somehow. No, I mean, this is an unprecedented thing. First of all, a human being that has no father, just right there, you got a, you know, a unique situation. That's why he's mono yanis, the unique son, usually translated. So what I want to get to here is verse 13 in all of this uh, long uh, introduction here. And so traditionally, verse 13 reads, Traditionally, in most of your translations, if not all. Actually, yeah, let's read from 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, the John, uh, the, the um, Reina Valera, which is the Spanish version of the King James, really, from 1995 translation, actually reads this way. He is the son of God, not by nature or human will, but because God has begotten him. The earliest written witness to the text of John 1.13 shows that in the second century, almost the identical <coughs> phrase, who was born of God, was to be found in St. John's Gospel. The singular reading is quoted by no less than four second century writers. From a text itself, in all probability, derived from Ephesus. What carries most weight, apart from the considerations of the intrinsic probability of a given reading, is not the number of manuscripts which support it, but the number of local texts which the manuscripts supporting it represent, or the age to which, by patristic quotations, it can be pushed back, even if every other manuscript is against it. Now this is just a, a short, um, a, sh a short quote from this excellent book that I recommend, *The Virgin Birth in History and Faith*. If you want to look into the history, but to be short and clear about this is most, if not all, of the early church fathers uh, have this reading reflected in the Reina Valera 95. In other words. It's talking about uh, Jesus as the one begotten of God, not about the believer, which is what most translations have, which, by the way, this is a very similar situation of 1 John 5, 18. I just noticed that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they apply it to us instead of the Son. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So we believe, Anthony and myself, uh, oh, oh, Talk, um, I'll bring Anthony here as, as an authority. Anthony believes that the original, if we want to call it original, but the earliest, 
And the reading that makes the most sense, because if you read it with this singular reading, it really flows very nice. You know, it sort of breaks off there when it's applied to us, whom, well, of course we know that we were, well, how's it put it? Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will, you know, it, it sort of, uh, of course we know this. Uh, but yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's uh, just a short of it, but really, if, if you want to look into the uh, history of this text, mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Anthony? Well, it's extreme, as Greg Dabble points out in his book, it's a very labored way of saying that Christians are not born of the will of male, uh, you know, male design, all that. The obvious sense here, you see why this is so terrific, is that at the end of the day, you are antichrist if you don't believe in the human Jesus. I, I'm urging Keegan Chandler never to lose sight of the main point here. That is, that the Johannine test of who is a, a true believer is the one who knows that Jesus is human. So once you've got a, not a virgin birth text in John, that's the thing the devil hates. And he's done his best to get rid of it. We could also add then Isaiah 9, 6, the child to be begotten, it should be translated, by God. The virgin birth is right there. It's also in Isaiah. Uh, a virgin will conceive, as Matthew says. So this is the beginning of Messiah. We, we talk in, in very elegant terms about the pre-existence of Jesus. Actually, that's a nonsense term. I think we need to get real with people and say, listen, if you want to believe in the real Jesus, you must believe in a descendant of David. Otherwise, you're simply wrong. And that's not doing you any good. And then the devil says, well, all they're arguing about Greek words. Wait a minute. You're talking about truth and error here. It's where the people at Kashmir did particularly well in the Church of God sector. They really took seriously the issue of truth and error on this point. So what we're doing today is, is not a minor thing. It's a huge, huge issue. Right. Uh, uh, Anthony, you were telling me this morning that um, I was pointing out that the uh, early fathers, so-called church fathers, uh, had this, it started to meddle with this incarnation, mm. which became capital I, which is, yep. he got the son or got the word to con flesh, yes. or, or went into Mary, you know, uh, came into Mary in the womb, and so on. And as to that, Mary. As to that, Mary is the fatal thing. Once you have somebody right. coming through the womb, you're into paganism, you're into another Jesus. Right, and you were telling me, yeah, but they, they still believe in the virgin birth. They, the church fathers. Yeah. Well, in a way, they do. In a way, they do quote Matthew and Luke. Yeah. But do, they really, do you really believe in the virgin birth when you posit his origin before the womb? Not really. Even you're, though, you're, you're, you're doing what but, liars do. Liars, in all fields, give with one hand and take away with the other. That's confusion. Your brain is suffering. Your health is suffering. See, I'm trying to get this out of the academic range of learned discussions about Greek words. It certainly has to be that. But I'm saying this is who you are before God. God looks down on the earth. He sees, here are the people who are taking my Shema seriously. Here are the people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's time then we got on board with that. Otherwise, we could be antichrist. And guess what? We could be rejected from the kingdom. Once we're told, of course, we have to become responsible. Right. Something like that. Just a disclaimer, uh, the words of Anthony and his words, a uh, liar and antichrist. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, that's John's word. Who is the liar? <laughs> who is the liar, John says, but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Yeah. Well, people are very clever at saying, well, I believe he's the Christ, and then you take it away with the other hand. Don't want to do that. That's killing you. That's the right. cyanide in your copy. Let's not do that. And my greater point here is that Church of God people need to get out there and talk about this. Come on now. Do we love the people out there? Much of COG has done very little with any of this in 150 years. They yeah. all could be talking about this, but we haven't done what the Jehovah's Witnesses have done with their somewhat crazy system. They're at the door beating on people's minds because they really care, maybe. So uh, here, Lorna will, will understand my point. The people at Kashmir <laughs> were, were incensed against error. That's a good sign. I think we need to be. Otherwise, are we loving these people? Paul was in the marketplace lobbying people. What are we doing? We're sitting watching our football. Maybe that's not good.
Again, disclaimer here, um, crazy <laughs> is a work used by Anthony. My word. His work, crazy JWs. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'll just finish up. Uh, let's see. Uh, son of God means you're not God. Right? Yes. So, Brown said it. Yeah, so we have the famous quote here from Professor at Fuller. Yeah. In the light of these passages in their context, the title Son of God is not in itself a designation of personal deity or an expression of metaphysical distinctions within the Godhead. Indeed, to be Son of God, one has to be a being who is not God. It is a des designation for a creature indicating a special relationship with God. In particular, it denotes God's representative, God's vice-regent. It is a designation of kingship, kingship, identifying the king as God's son. It's interesting, the word creature he uses there is similar to some of the early fathers who disagreed, mm -hmm. who used the word creature for, it's actually a word used by Paul in, in the letter to the Colossians. Uh, he calls uh, Jesus a creature there as well. Okay, um, all right, so we'll, We'll leave it here because time is running out. Or, okay, let, let me just quickly go through this uh, uh, last slide. Uh, a conception of procreation. Uh, what do I mean by that? There's this very interesting verse in Matthew 120, which I talked about earlier. Most translations have what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. But really the Greek, and that's uh, reflected in those versions, NIV, a lot of versions have that. But there's other translations, uh, mainly the literal, Young's literal, Darby. That which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, on, on first viewing, this might not seem like a big thing, but it is. Now, let me quickly tell you why. Because most translations are hiding the action of the Father by rendering the Greek there as conceived. Uh, with the action of the mother. Again, the action of the father is to beget, to procreate, right? And the action of the mother is the conceiver. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, again, this compromises the virgin birth, the coming into existence, as Luke talks about of the son, by his procreation by God's spirit in the womb of Mary. Now, to make this point a bit clearer for us, uh, this is Lee, a book called The Conclusion of the New Testament. The word conceived is a proper, normal, ordinary description of conception within a woman. The word begotten is a particular expression used to describe the conception that had taken place in Mary's womb. Within Mary, something was not merely conceived, but was begotten. In English, the past participle of beget is begotten, and the past participle of bear is born. Furthermore, in English, we can differentiate the words beget and bear using beget to refer to the male and bear for the female. The male generates the conception and the female completes the conception by her delivery of the child. Then we have the birth. Now, this is the normal human process, but here, obviously, God did not have sex with Mary, as the Islamic view promotes. That is just blasphemous. We don't believe that. That's not what Luke and Matthew are saying. The simple point here is that the action of God the Father is that through his spirit, through the power of the spirit, he miraculously procreates or begets the son in the womb of Mary. And the simple point here is that the first uh, translations, most of the translations have conceived, hide this fact. Because if you translate it, that which is begotten in her, in her, see how that actually flows very well and harmonizes well with Luke, mm -hmm. who talks about a begetting in the womb as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the simple point there. Um, let me finish with this. Yep, let me finish with this quote from um, another book I would recommend called The... Uh, Incarnation and Myth, uh, edited by Golder. The debate continued. Uh, it's a good book. So if you want to look into that. And let me finish with a quote from this book, which I thought sums up this uh, 
origin. It's in a chapter in a in an essay. This book has a essays. It's a compilation of essays. There's a one called Paradox and Mystification by Mr. Golder. This is the challenge to incarnationalists. Unless some continuity between the word and Jesus is being asserted, their doctrine is not a paradox, but a mystification, not an apparent contradiction, but apparent nonsense. As a belief, it goes into inverted commas, quote marks, that would be, what this means and what grounds there can be for accepting it, other than reluctance to allow that the church has been in error, remain obscure. Our concern with Christology is a concern for truth. If St. Paul and St. John believe something that we cannot make sense of, that is sad. My impression is that these days the Chalcedonian definition discloses nothing except its defender's wish to be orthodox. Amen. That's marvelous. What page is that? That is terrific. Every church of God preacher needs to be preaching at every Sunday. That's terrific. What page is that, Carlos? Uh, this is in his essay, uh, yeah. Paradox. Let me yeah. put it up here. Uh, sorry, no. but I, it starts on page Anthony 51. Okay, great. Thank you. It starts on 51. So, yeah, that is. Uh, that's basically what we're dealing here with, folks. Uh, uh, Pannenberg, in his book, God and Man, also mm. makes the very telling point. What was the quote he paraphrased earlier about contradiction? Uh, you can have the virgin birth, or you can have the pre-existence, but you can kind of both. have both together. Right, yeah. so Pannenberg and others say it very plainly, too, that you can have the eternal son, and you can have the virgin birth narrative, mm. but you can't have both because they they clash, they, they contradict each other. So you have to choose, folks. That's the point here. As I had to choose, when I found the textual evidence of Matthew 118, it was quite striking to me. Mm. Totally changed my my view, which I, I already was questioning the whole Orthodox system anyway, as it is. So so yeah, that's, uh, I'll close with that quote and I'll open it up here in a little while. So that is, so next week we'll go to, uh, next time, I'm sorry, not next week. I, <laughs> next time we will do uh, chapter 10 and we'll look at the title of the Son of Man. I believe, and uh, in two weeks uh, we'll, we'll do that because we've, we've gone uh, bi-weekly this year, so next week we will look at, actually uh, this is the second to last one, I, I added one, I, uh, we were going to finish on part 10, uh, you know, it's gone 10 parts, so it's pretty long, but I had to add a, a last uh, say on the Christology before we move on. But then uh, I promise we'll move on to uh, unit uh, five, which will be uh, the so-called uh, end days, eschaton or eschatology, the, the study of the end days. So we'll do that in unit five.